Hemostasis occurs right after initial injury. At the time of injury, epinephrine, a chemical that constricts peripheral blood vessels, is released in an attempt to minimize bleeding into the soft tissues. The key cell responsible for this function is the platelet, which causes the body to form a clot to prevent further bleeding. There is an increased aggregation of platelets to enable the wounded vessel to complete the clotting process. Platelets also release key cytokines, such as platelet-derived growth factor, that call in cells to participate in later phases of healing. The objective of the hemostasis phase of wound healing is to control bleeding. Following hemostasis, the inflammatory phase begins. The local signs and symptoms that occur during the inflammatory phase are swelling, increased fluid, perfusion of blood, redness, release of epinephrine, histamine, heat, histamine response, and pain. The inflammatory phase is characterized by a host of cells, leukocytes and macrophages, infiltrating the wound sites. Bleeding is controlled by hemostasis. Any bacteria that is present is destroyed by leukocytes, particularly the polymorphonuclear neutrophils. About four days after the injury, macrophages work to destroy bacteria, cleansing the wound of cellular debris. Macrophages replace the leukocytes and produce a host of cytokines and growth factors. These act as chemoattractants to other cells needed for tissue repair. Macrophages also convert macromolecules into the amino acids and sugars necessary for wound healing. It is thought that the macrophage also attracts contractual cells to the wound to encourage wound contraction. Vasodilation with resultant edema, warmth, and rubor are the result of factors secreted from the macrophage and other leukocytes present at the wound site in response to the inflammatory process. The objectives of the inflammatory phase of wound healing are to clean debris and bacteria and prevent infection. Scar tissue formation is characterized by three distinct phases, granulation, contraction, epithelialization. Click on one of the phases to learn more. In an open wound, granulation tissue is generated, producing red, beefy, shiny tissue with a granular appearance. This tissue consists of fibroblasts, capillaries, and neutrophils. As this type of tissue proliferates, fibroblasts stimulate the production of collagen, which gives tissue its tensile strength and structure. As the, as the wound site fills with granulation tissue, its margins contract or pull together, decreasing the size of the wound. The extent of contraction is dependent upon the mobility of the surrounding tissue. During the epithelialization, the final step of this phase, cells migrate from the wound margins, divide, and ultimately touch one another, sealing the wound. Epithelialization can only occur in the presence of viable vascular tissue. Epithelial cells will not migrate across a dry surface or necrotic tissue. During the maturation phase, the collagen fibers reorganize, remodel, and mature, gaining tensile strength. Collagen fibers, proteoglycans, and fibronectin are rearranged and redistributed. The scar becomes less cellular and gains tensile strength. However, this tissue will always be at risk for breakdown because its tensile strength is less than that of uninjured skin. Collagen synthesis begins with the fibroblast, which secretes procollagen. The growth of the procollagen fibers is a complicated process. Macrophage and platelets are key growth factors in the development of procollagen. Procollagen fibers mature into collagen fibril. The fibrils then link together into a very strong, rope-like collagen fiber. There are about 10,000 fibrils interconnected within a single collagen fiber. Research is currently underway to determine the chemical details associated with collagen synthesis.